There we go. Okay. So as I was mentioning, my name is Nelly. Um, I'm one of the full writers. I was in Chile from December 2016 to through August 2017. Um, and my project is called Obesidad de Calidad de Vida y Inicio de Pubertad de los Adolescentes in Chile. Um, and even though this presentation is in Spanish, um, for the sake of um, easiness for me, I'm going to be doing it in English. Um, these are the collaborators and the um, sponsor for and the funding for this project. Um, the funding came from the U.S. Student Fulbright Program, and the list of um, collaborators that I had are listed there as well. Um, and I'm especially well. I'm very appreciative of all of them, but um, I also want to give a special thank you to Camila Colorvalan, who is my academic advisor for this project. Um, so basically, um, this is just a brief timeline of my project. Um, really, it was divided into three parts. For the first three months that I was in Chile, it was a lot of lit review, um, looking at scales that have already been used, um, and translating those tools into Chilean Spanish. Um, and then um, March through April, um, I did pre-testing and sort of getting everything set up for the pilot study. And then May through July was really the meat um, and the bulk of the project where I did the pilot study on 100 adolescents um, and analyzed the, that data. Um, so just to give you a brief sense of the lit review, um, obesity is a big problem in Chile. Um, and it's a problem that's been developing only in the very most recent decades. This graph specifically shows um, the rates of obesity from 1987 to 2013. Um, and you can see how that like increased um, really dramatically, like especially among the boys. Um, what I was what I would say about this is just, um, you know, the the um, the fact that uh, this obesity epidemic is developing in Chile is very well known. Um, but um, really this study is then looking at what impact does that um, obesity epidemic have in the lives of these kids on like a daily basis through quality of life questionnaires. Um, so previous studies have noted an association between quality of life and obesity. Um, and the subskills that um, are most impacted according to the previous research are physical functioning and um, emotional health or self-esteem. Um, and previous researchers have also noted the importance of self-perception, um, meaning that people's perceived weight um, might be just as important to um, the way that they think about um, the way that they think about quality of life as their actual weight. Um, and even though the association between pu quality of life and puberty is less, and onset of puberty is less clear, um, we still decided that that'd be something of interest to look at in our study, um, especially given that the kids are now um, 13 to 14 years old. Um, so that has also been included in part of the analysis. Um, in terms of what's missing from the literature, a lot of these um, studies looking at the association between quality of life um, and obesity have come from the U.S. and Europe, which also means that, which also means that the um, scales that are typically used also mostly come from those countries. Um, so what we wanted to do is, first of all, um, make sure that the, these types of scales still um, are valid and still make sense in a different cultural context, such as Chile, and then also examine um, and see if those same associations hold true in, other, in, in this other country. Um, and then also, like again, keeping in mind that Chile is a, is a country that's more recently going through this obesity epidemic. And so you know the realities um, might be different there um, because of that as well. Um, so these are just quickly the pre uh, questions of the study. Again, um, the main one is what is the associations between quality of life, obesity, and onset of puberty? And then in terms of the pilot, we also wanted to look at other factors that might relate to um, these associations, such as if people are responding to the uh, to the surveys online or in person, if that would influence their answers and also the location of the study visit. So that's more of like implementation and for piloting purposes. Um, and again, this is um, this, this quality of life scale is going to be incorporated into the ECHO study, um, which is a longitudinal study of 1,200 adolescents about um, who were enrolled in the study through um, different um, hardly even infantilis or, or kindergartens when they were very little. Um, so right now, these kids are 11 to 14 years old. And the measures that are already collected as part of this study are measures about um, 
growth and development and anthropomorphic measures, we have diet, we have environmental exposures and onset and uh, initiation and progression of puberty as well as yeah environmental factors. So that's why, um, again, it makes sense to, to incorporate a quality of life skill into what's already being measured and already being collected. Um, we think um, that the way in which, in terms of the hypothesis, we do think the way in which we apply the questionnaire could affect the results um, and the answers that people provide to the scales. So that's looking at um, online versus in person and also in terms of location. So BUC is the, is the hospital at the Universidad Católica and then INTA is where the study was based off of and those are the two locations. Um, we also thought that obesity would be associated with um, worse scores on the quality of life scales and that um, onset of puberty could also influence or ha could be associated with differences in the quality of life scales. Um, and more specifically, we thought that girls could have, um, that have early onset of puberty could have wor worse scores on these scales. Um, I'm just gonna look at the objective, the general objective and the first specific objective here. Basically, again, um, the general objective was to take a scale um, that's related to quality of life um, and um, implement it as part of the ECHO study. And then the, the, the specific goal or the specific objective was to um, develop the scale of quality of life um, that's valid and make sure that it's also age culturally and linguistically appropriate for this cohort in ECHO and realize um, this pilot, which we did. Um, and then the other, the other objectives um, are gonna be continued even though I'm back in the US. Um, so the, in terms of methodology, um, this is a, this is a longitudinal, this is a pilot, um, that's part of a longitudinal and observational study. Um, the first step was just developing the questionnaire, which includes lit review, uh, choosing a scale, the pre-testing, um, and then there was a pilot and then the, um, analysis, um, statistical analysis, which included a conformatory factor analysis, convex alpha, test tree, test reliability, and descriptive statistics. Um, and now, um, they're continuing to implement, um, the, the, they're continuing now to implement the survey as part of the actual um, ECHO study as opposed to the pilot, which I think is really exciting. Um, so the questionnaire we ended up choosing was the Kindle, and we chose it because it was one of the shortest questionnaires, and it has a module specifically related to obesity, um, and there's already a version that's valid in Spain, um, which makes my work of transcription and translation a little bit easier, and it's also free. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but this is just to show you all the different versions and all the work that the um, original research group put into um, developing these surveys, um, which meant that I then, um, it saved me a lot of time when I actually went to adapt these versions into Chilean Spanish because I could um, take what was already written in Spanish from Spain and and use that. Um, so in terms of the language adaptation and pretesting, um, you know the graph up above sort of oops, sort of shows like my process. Um, and then for the pretesting, um, the methodology that we used was the paraphrasing method that is part of the Think Loud method. Um, so basically, the Think Aloud method is you're talking through um, your responses and how you got to each spot response as the questions are presented and then the paraphrasing method is really just focused on comprehension so like how are these kids defining certain phrases certain um certain questions like what do they think the research are are trying to ask them about um so just to show you um some of the language adaptations we did even before pre-testing um a lot of the ones in the general kindle survey were just grammatical answer questions and then the ones I'm in mean, the adiposity module were both um, grammatical and um, and vocabulary based. So you know, por mi culpa de mi peso, mis compañeros me pasaron al lado de mí cuando hacen algo juntos. We changed that to mis compañeros me excluyeron cuando hacen algo juntos. Just trying to simplify things, make it easier to understand in Spanish. So each of so for the pretesting, I interviewed seven kids, and, um, and each uh, survey took about. Uh, 10 to 25 minutes. Um, in general, the kids really understood what we were saying, but then there were still like a lot of variations in how they defined certain terms. For example, the the very simple phrase, durante la semana pasada, yo tuve muchas buenas ideas. I had many good ideas during the past week. Some kids define that as I thought, um, 
you know, really creatively and had some really good ideas about things. And then other kids to find that as, you know, I um, had good ideas and then acted on those ideas. So, you know, whether people think it's one thing or another is going to obviously change how they respond to that question when we present the actual survey. Having said all that, like, even though the questions are very big and like we recognize that, um, we only really made three changes um, after the pretesting, which all of our changes were approved by this group that originally developed the survey from Germany. Um, and those changes are listed there. And again, they're mostly just grammatical, nothing um, profound in terms of the content, changing the content of the questions themselves. Um, however, to make the survey more, um, more uh, consistent and, you know, make it have more more sense in the context of our questions in Chile, we did change some of the answer options so that they'd be more specific. And then we also changed some other questions again, just so that they would make sense in the context in which we were collecting these surveys. Moving on to the pilot, um, our study visits were located at INTA in the Universidad Católica, as I said. Um, some of our surveys, uh, you know, there was the option to do the surveys directly online in REDCap um, if there was Wi-Fi available. And if not, they would do the questions um, on paper and then I would enter them into REDCap. And actually, Jamie at one point helped me with that. And so I'm very appreciative of her for that. Um, and then um, ideally the, the kids would fill out the surveys twice, once at the beginning and once at the end of the question of the, of the study visit when they went in for their echo visits. But um, at the very least, we wanted them to fill out the survey once. Um, and then in terms of the analysis, I've already mentioned, we did the CFA or the uh, confirmatory factor analysis, convex alpha um, was done in R, test retest reliability, which is a Pearson's test, was also done in R, and then we did a bunch of um, descriptive statistics as well. Um, and we haven't gotten around to doing some of them. I still need to work through the um, analysis of the onset of puberty and um, perceived weight as opposed, um, the actual weight has been done um, in terms of descriptive statistics well, in terms of descriptive statistics, but the perceived weight has not. So there's a couple of analyses that are still pending, but I'm going to show you what I have or what I was able to do so far. So this is just um, uh, uh, um, this is just like what we um, <laughs> sorry, this is what we um, presented in terms of like location um, and descriptive statistics in terms of location. The only significant the only substantial difference was that there was more girls at INTA than at the Universidad Católica. And that was in part because um, they were, I collected data for this survey while they were also doing a, a pilot study on breast tissue and, and breast development. So that explains that. Um, in terms of like study descriptive, like there are, um, there were some variables we collected in terms of like the time of day that kids completed the surveys and the way in which they completed them. And, um, Basically, there's a lot less time at the Universidad Católica to, to complete these surveys, which explains a lot of these um, studies. Um, because they were, there was less time, we, we tried to do more of the online data collection at the Universidad Católica, which still, unfortunately, didn't really work out. Um, and then all of the, and then again, because of the shortness of time, like fewer of those kids could complete um, the, second, um, the second survey as well at that at that site. Um, and then also in terms of time, you know, all of the, or the vast majority of the study visits at INTA were in the morning and then the ones at the University of Catholic were like five or six at night. Um, so that explains a lot of that. Um, luckily at both sites, these surveys took like five to 10 minutes to complete on average, which was really nice because it meant, you know, we don't want this to be a long survey. We don't want it to be very burdensome on the kids. Um, so that was nice to know for sure. Um, this is the confirmatory factor analysis. Um, I included the validated group from Germany because really what I wanted to show is that even in the best case population, uh, best case um, conduct, uh, you know, distribution of these surveys where you have a large sample size of, of more than 6,000 kids where it's in the native language um, that the survey has been developed in, like there were still like not great results for the Ramsey score and the CFI and TLI. Um, you want a Ramsey score of below 0 0.5 and you know this German group got 0 0.64, 0 0.66 um, and then my like Ramsey scores were even worse than that 0 0.86, 0 0.84 so like it basically all the Ramsey scores are all this is looking at is like do the um, 
statistical do the statistic do the statistics do the data that's collected like reflect the theoretical model um and the answer is not really um so that was definitely a triply, tricky thing and it means that like sort of the rest of the analyses do need to be taken a little bit with a grain of salt um Having said that the Chromebex Alpha test-retest reliability were both really good. Um, the floor and ceiling effects were a little high, but I think that's because we like sort of condensed some of the survey responses and trying to get them to work with the confirmatory factor analysis. So you see with the autopocity module and with some like the friends and amigo subscales, like they are a little high there. But um, for the most part, um, you know, they're they're acceptable. Um, and it does mean that, you know, we could use the total score even if, you know, some of the subscale stuff is a little bit iffy um, for the CFA. Um, this is just briefly, like, um, the mean and standard deviations of our of our um, quality of life scale for Chile and, other, and Germany, where the surveys were originally collected. In general, it seems like our sample had a little bit lower scores than the sample from Germany. Um, but things um, things are more or less consistent. Be excuse me, between the two um, between the two studies, and then this is looking at um, quality of life in terms of like the rest of the descriptive statistics. Um, the ones that are gender, the ones that were statistically significant were gender, and again very similar to previous studies. Um, it seems like women had lower quality of life scores than. And men, um, and that's and that's also something that's been reflected in the previous literature too. In terms of, and then these are sort of the last results in terms of weight. Um, the Kindle module didn't have any difference between underweight um, or normal weight kids versus overweight or no obese kids, but the adiposity module did um, did have a lower, uh, a statistically significant lower quality of life scores for overweight and obese kids, which meant, which is a good sign. Um, it means that it's, you know, it's a sign that it could be measuring what it's supposed to be measuring, which is good. Um, I sort of already went through what each of the results mean, but... Um, Basically, like the everything, all the all the tests of reliability and validity um, were acceptable, except for this the confirmatory factor analysis. Um, you know, uh, women had lower quality of life scores than men, and then um, there was no difference in the Kindle and the general quality of life scores in terms of um, weight, but there was in for the adiposity module, which was good. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Um, oh, in terms of next steps, like as I mentioned before, uh, they're going to keep using the Kindle to collect quality of life data in the ECHO study, which is exciting. And I'm going to also be continuing with the data analysis for the onset of puberty and perceived weight. Um, you know, there were some limitations of the study. Obviously, it was a small sample size. I'm not an expert in Chilean Spanish, so it could be that the translations that we came up with still aren't quite perfect. Um, but, um, and again, like just the fact that some of the study visits were a little bit rushed. Anyways, I was really uh, appreciative of all the support and uh, collaboration that happened at INTA. I really appreciated this opportunity to come to Chile. And for those of you who are still in the country, I hope you have a really great rest of your time. Enjoy. And thank you so much. Bye-bye.